everybody. Welcome to our in-person and full capacity audience tonight. Um, you're in for a treat this evening. I'm Amy McDonald. I run this joint. I want to thank our wonderful partners in this curated cuisine series, BU, BU's program in food and wine. We couldn't do it without them. We are in for a real treat, as I said. Ming Tsai has had an extraordinary career introducing the public to the wonders of East-West cuisine for 20 years and counting. He has twice been recognized with James Beard Awards in 1998 for Best New Restaurant for Blue Ginger, his inaugural restaurant. How many people have he, I know it closed for you, yeah. Uh, one of our favorites. And in 2022 for Best Chef Northeast. His TV show, Simply Ming, is the longest running cooking show on PBS and has received two Emmy nominations for Outstanding Culinary Program and Outstanding Lifestyle Culinary Host. We are in good hands with our frequent curated cuisine interlocutor, Irene Lee, who is also a James Beard award-winning chef. Irene has just opened Mei Mei Dumpling Factor, a 4,000 square foot dumpling factory and cafe in South Boston. And with her sister, Margaret, her book, Perfectly Good Food, will be published later this spring, and she and her sister will be here May 31st for our Curated Cuisine series. Take it away, Irene and Ming. Good evening, everyone. What a treat. Hey, Ming. Uh, hello. How hello. are you doing, Irene? I'm thank doing you, great. Amy. Thank you for that nice introduction. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so I thought we would start at the beginning. OK, what's the difference between <laughs> Dubai and Abu Dhabi? Anyone? <clears throat> Dubai, they don't like the Flintstones, but Abu Dhabi do. <clears throat> you have two sons, right, Ming? That's a mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, you grew up in Dayton, Ohio. Culinary capital of the world. That's right. Um, and did you go by Ming when you were growing up? Uh, Emperor was better, but <laughs> that was on the tag field. No, yeah, I went by Ming, except my brother is named Ming, as all our cousins are, because we're the Ming generation. And it's, it's just what us Chinese do. And so I called him Xi because he was Ming Xi, and he called me Hao because I was Ming Hao. So all his friends called me Hao, all his friends called him Xi, right? That, but we're both known as Ming Tsai in the real world, and he does a lot of IT consulting, and sometimes we cross over. We were both at Target one time for five years, and he would start the meeting with the CEO doing talking about the computer systems, like, hey, how's my brother's mango salsa doing? And <laughs> stuff like that. And your Wikipedia page also says that you are named Clayton. Okay, moving on. Okay, got it. <laughs> that my mom, um, who is adorable, if you've seen her on my show, she's yep. absolute pain in the ass, and uh, in a good way. Uh, like all Jewish moms and Mexican moms, Chinese moms are all the same, right? They're like your dumpling doesn't look very good. Like mom, this is my show. <laughs> anyway, um, she liked Clayton because it was different. And right now, I'm actually trying to get my real. ID, right, the DMV. And for some reason, when I got my license first in Massachusetts, I wanted to be Ming Tsai, because that's who I am. But I made my license Ming Tsai. But my passport, my global, everything else says Clayton Ming Tsai. Mm. So now they're like, you don't exist. I'm like, dude, I'm right here. I did exist. There are actually two See? of you. Here's, so I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna bring some Ming's Bings. Great. And, should, um, should work. Or your dumplings, one of the two. Yes. And your parents had a family restaurant in Dayton, and your dad was also a rocket scientist. My, is it hot? I also just been <laughs> cooking. No, but seriously, is it hot, or is it just me? Well, I, so you may not know this, but men go through menopause, too. <laughs> True fact, Asian men. Um, <clears throat> my mom had the Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin Kitchen. My dad literally is a rocket scientist. He was designing the B-1 bomber at the time at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, civilian at the Air Force. Um, he helped my mom at the restaurant with, he, my dad actually should have put, of all the patents he has, he has four. His fifth one should have been batch cooking, because he invented what Chipotle's does today. 
because a Chinese restaurant in downtown Arcade Mall, where we did 200 people, 150 in an hour and a half, you can't do traditional Chinese food. You can't do one mugu gai one sweet and sour pork. It's impossible. So he actually did five orders of Mongolian beef, five orders of pork, five orders, and then people came, rice noodles, protein sauce, gone. So that's exactly what Chipotle's does. And um, so that's dad. Dad is 93. He lives in Honolulu. He works full time today. And full time for him, because he's Chinese, is six days a week, right? <laughs> um, and he, his fourth patent is called Double Double. It is graphite laminated to make a fuselage that is stronger, lighter than any other possible fuselage in the world. A fuselage, of course, is everything from Callaway Golf to train to submarines to missiles to airplanes. So it's every major, it's a trillions of dollars of potential. And he figured out a way, this is my dad, literally is a genius. He figured out that graphite is one of the only materials at minus 100 Kelvin expands and everything else shrinks. So he's now putting graphite tubes inside of stainless steel and aluminum tubes, like based after the Wellington bomber the English used to do, which is a skeleton, and he freezes it and the graphite seals to the skeleton without epoxy, without rivets, without anything. He just needs to be around for another freaking 20 years so I can cash in. <laughs> Come on, Dad, get to work. And um, I can tell from the way you're, you're talking about this patent that um, you graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering. And, um, and we're here today doing this. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up with Blue Ginger? With you, Irene, yes. and Pinot Grigio? <laughs> Indeed. From New Jersey. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's quite good. Um, so. I am and still, I was and still am a good Chinese son. I had to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. That was it. Those are my three choices. <clears throat> my parents actually had a couple other rules, which is get any grades you want, son, as long as they're straight A's, <laughs> and marry anyone you want. We really prefer Chinese, right? <laughs> so I am absolutely 0 for 3. Um, <laughs> Polly is the waspiest wasp from Dayton, Ohio possible. <laughs> she actually lived across the street from me, literally like a par three from me. We never met in Dayton, Ohio. It's a crazy story. That's a really crazy story because, and I was just there, and talk about how history repeats. I just got to see my son play his last senior Yale squash match in two, 23, and I was on that same court in 86. And that's significant because the Yale squash coach, David Talbot, who just retired two years ago, was my squash coach, and her youngest sister was Polly. And Polly was at CU Boulder. This is going to come, this is going to coalesce I'm, perfectly. I'm ready, yeah. Like a creme anglaise. <laughs> my wife's at CU Boulder, and she decides to study Chinese. She didn't want the, all these big classes at CU Boulder. And as another side story, one of her roommates or actually only roommate was a great guy that decided to study Japanese. Random Long Island Jew named Ivan Orkin. Now, if you know that name, if you're a foodie, Ivan Orkin became the gaijin that went to Tokyo and says, I'm gonna make the best bowl of ramen against all of you Japanese chefs. And he did. He has Ivan Ramen in New York. He's unbelievable and one of our best friends. So just random. This is sophomore year. They met at a Greenpeace probably getting stoned, right? <laughs> And now Ivan's a great friend, of course. He's an amazing chef. So my wife spoke Chinese, a girl from the time, came to Yale in 1983 to visit brother David, met me. David's like, oh, there's a Chinese guy on my team. He's pretty cool. He speaks Chinese, blah, blah, blah. She wanted nothing to do with me. For 10 years, I literally wrote her notes thinking about you. I sent her care packages in Beijing. She was living with her boyfriend at the time. I didn't care. It didn't matter. It wasn't my boyfriend. And they weren't married. So what the hell? There's no rules. And um, I, I had my parents take her out to dinner when they went to Beijing. They had no idea who she was. And it was like, anything I could do, so give her some Hershey kisses. And then 10 years later, we ended up in San Francisco. She broke up with someone. I broke up with someone who's my girlfriend at the time. Guess what her name was? Ming. And true story, Ming and Ming. Wasn't going to work out. Um, so yeah, that. So that's how, we, that's how I met my wife. And the engineering. I studied, I did it, I do everything gung ho. By junior year, I was done. But every summer during college, I started going to Paris. My dad's partner of his company called Think Composites is Thierry Massard ran Europe, and then Professor Hayashi ran Asia. 
And Thierry is one of a great family friend. I'm not the godfather of their first son, Sebastian. So really tight family friends at a free place to stay in Paris, which is amazing. First summer, Alliance Francaise, the master French, because I had, you know, bonjour from, from Andover. That was it. Yeah, and the French don't speak any English at all. And the chefs in France, how are you? Goodbye. That's it. That's it, right? And maybe, you know, and maybe a couple of the Hogan heroes. That's it. And Schultz, right? Beep le beau. And um, so I, I, I went the second summer. I did apprenticeships, boulangeries. I eventually went to Cordon Bleu. And at Cordon Bleu, I'm like, wow, damn, the French can cook too. Because up until that time, it was about Chinese food, right? I knew Chinese well. I loved the French. And after I graduated, I sat my mom and dad down. I said, look, guys, I'm going to finish the major because you spent a couple hundred, few hundred thousand dollars here. So we'll get the piece of paper. That's important. So I got my degree. But I'm going to move to Paris and cook. And my mom, if you again on my show, it gives me a huge hug. Says, "Son, you're so lucky. At 18, you already know your passion. Promise to give 110 percent. We support you completely." Now, keep in mind, I'm first generation. Right? Both my parents are born in Beijing, and the one métier that I shouldn't have chosen because after the building the railroads and after the gold rush, the Chinese ended up in San Francisco, in Chinatown, and the only métier a lot of male Chinese, because all there were were males, was to cook. Wash clothes and to cook were the two métiers Chinese men could do. And I do Andover, yeah, and I want to cook. So <laughs> most Chinese parents would have been like, are you kidding me? I, we, we swam across the ocean for this, right? I mean, but my parents, are they were both schooled in America, right? Mom went to NU, dad was Yale. Um, so they were Americanized. They were actually just cool. My mom gives me a hug, says, you're so lucky. I look at my dad, again, the rocket scientist, and he just... Deadpan says, son, you weren't going to be a very good engineer anyway. Go cook. <laughs> <laughs> True story. But nothing makes Chinese parents prouder than eating for free for the entire existence of all my restaurants right. and their friends and their friends' friends and friends' friends. That's right. So they, they got it back in spades. Mom, does that sound familiar? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, did she give you a 20% discount for dumplings? I certainly hope so. <laughs> Do you charge her for sauce? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Nice to meet you, by the way. Neither the jiaozi hao bao. Bi ta hao, dou dai. Hai kai. How's your jiaozi? I speak French. <laughs> so, okay, it wasn't mechanical engineer or doctor or lawyer. If it wasn't chef, what do you think it would be? Uh, that's a great question. I, If I could sing, I'd love to be on stage singing, like Sting, because it's so close to my name. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like so close. I could have been Sting, but M Ming instead. Maybe the next career. Yeah. So and, and I do love pro athlete. I mean, I'd, I'd be fun to be TB12 for a while, I guess, right? Up until two years ago. Right. Right? <laughs> Tommy should have retired. <laughs> We're not as smart as you women. We're just not. So we'll talk about what you did do, which was open Blue Ginger, which was open for 19 years. Yep. And you pioneered the kind of food that made it possible for someone like me to open Mei Mei. And I'm that much older than you? God, that hurts. I have many, many family photos Taiwan, taken in the dining room. <laughs> um, and I, I wanted to ask, um, I think we have many Blue Ginger devotees here. Um, was it hard to make the decision to close it, or were you oh, ready? Uh, one of the hardest. I've actually, <clears throat> I don't think I've ever cried so much, besides maybe a you know, grandparent's funeral. Um, a really hard decision. I mean, Blue Ginger was our life. It was my, the first restaurant that I actually owned with my wife, right? And it was, it, it means everything when you own it, right? And when you're working with someone else, Hotel Intercontinental, it's a job, and you're, you're a cog in the wheel. But when you are the wheel, it's a big deal. And I literally, our entire lives were grown at Blue Ginger. We were just married. We had no children. You know, our kids are 20 and 22 now. We, we opened this restaurant. We, this is one of the proudest things I can say about Blue Ginger. We had 13 marriages. One of the sous chefs married someone, divorced someone, then married another Blue Ginger employee. <laughs> totally fucked up the ratio. I'm like, dude, you are messing up my marriage ratio. Can't divorce and remarry, but he did. 
Uh, and we have seven children. Not mine. I have two of my own. But Blue Ginger produced seven children. Which, so everyone, so the rumor was, you want to get married? Go work at Blue Ginger. <laughs> and, um, or except for that one guy. So my you point is, twice. literally, there are people that have been there for the entire 19 years. Right? Uh, Mario, first prep cook. Stayed the entire time. I can think of Jen and Jill, my two wait, wait, waitresses. We could call them waitresses back then. That's how long ago it is. Servers now, right? Uh, st were with me. So it, w it, was, it was our whole life. And it also made me, right? It was the first restaurant that put me on the map. And other things happened as well. But it was the first restaurant that, you know, proudly we got our accolades. We got our three stars. We got, you know, all the, all the awards. And we don't do it for awards, but it's so nice to be, you know, anointed by your peers, like the James Beard Award. It's always, it means a lot to us chefs. And so, but it was a business decision because I knew I had a restaurant coming online in Big Sky, Montana called Baba, which is now three years old. And I'm the type of chef that I need to be there and make sure the food's there and be there as much as possible. So I'm there half the year it's open now in Big Sky. And so I knew I couldn't do both well. And, and it was at the exact moment that my lease was up, I, they wanted they they offered me amazingly at least twenty percent cheaper. They would love me to have stayed. Um, and that's really amazing because rents are going up. Um, but I just didn't for me to do another ten years, plus ten on top of that. I had to put another I don't know three million into it to renovate and make it beautiful and pretty again. And to me, it was almost like starting over. Right. And and I just didn't want to. I love Wellesley. I love everything about. It. I just didn't want to have have to be there another ten years with other projects coming on. And at that time, I had Blue Dragon. I didn't know there was going to be a world pandemic. I would have told you all, seriously, but I didn't know. And that, you know, that ended up closing Blue Dragon. Right. Um, but I will tell you this, because you may ask, so, but kind of a blessing in disguise in a way for me, because in February, I launched, launched Ming's Bings, and COVID started in March. Wow. So you either froze or rose during COVID. And because of that timing, um, I actually didn't go bonkers. I actually had something to do because once Blue Dragon was closed, um, as a chef, I, I have to be doing something. And if I didn't have Ming's Bings, I literally would have gone bonkers. So thank God for Ming's Bings. Oh, look. It's on my thing. Oh, look. It's on my phone. Oh, look. It's on my. Never mind. <laughs> it is, though. Two layers of branded apparel. If you have a question for Ming, by the way, you can oh, yeah, go ask. to sli.do oh, right? oh, and enter cuisine. Uh, so and we'll I get to as many questions as we can. Can I ask myself a question? Yeah, absolutely. Please. <laughs> Where do you work out? No, <laughs> um, we do have one audience question. Um, what was your most challenging dish you ever made? And what was the most inspiring food you got to cook? Great question, guys. Keep it up. Um, most challenging dish. Uh, I think I probably played around with making my tea smoked Peking duck more than any other dish because um, there's just so many variables when you do Peking duck. It's a 48 hour process. You need to get Confucius butchered ducks, which are ducks that are eviscerated, with still the head and neck on. Because for those who's made Peking duck recently, <laughs> Mama and <Nimeo. laughs> You give the duck a tracheotomy, right? That's step one. So literally, you cut the throat, you stick a tube down its throat, and you take an air compressor, you turn it on, and you blow air through the duck, and it separates the skin from the meat. So it forces air, the duck gonflates like this, and that's the secret. So when it roasts, because now the membrane's been separated, the fat can render off. I always make this statement slash joke. Think about those six or eight really drunk Chinese chefs hanging out in China, <laughs> probably stoned out of their heads on opium, and someone stands up, Wang Fu's like, I'm going to go blow a duck. <laughs> Think about that. That's one brave man, right? I mean, first of all, is a duck alive or dead? We don't know. And who says that in public? <laughs> but he did, and that's how, that's why it's the most incredible technique. But even more than souffles and 
croissants and all the lamination and think of all the amazing techniques. Not, not even touching molecular gastronomy. That's a whole other thing. Uh, is it real food? Yes, but not quite. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when it explodes in your mouth four times, it's enough, right? After three, I'm good. And, um, but a 48-hour process to make a dish, I think, is incredible. Thank you. And then you. what was the other question? Most, that's the most hardest dish. Most inspired? Yeah. That I've eaten or I've cooked? What's the question? Whatever you prefer, since we don't know who answered the question. We don't know who answered. Who asked this question? Damn it. No. <laughs> they um, might be at home. I, the most inspired dish is my last dish that I cooked. And the, the day I don't say that, then I sh can't be a chef anymore. Because hmm. you're not continually excited and inspired by, man, I love Pop-Tarts, but <laughs> I'm going to slice it this way. <laughs> Best fucking Pop-Tart ever, right? <laughs> That's how I think. I'm like, well, how do you try it? He says, honey, it's a Pop-Tart. No, but try it. And so that's what I think is the most inspired. My most inspired meal um, was probably at El Bui, uh, Fran Adria in La Rosa, Spain. It was his last year. So Fran Adria kind of made Jose Andres and Gran Atkins and all these milk gastronomy chefs who they are. And it was a five and a half hour, 37 course meal. <laughs> you did not look at your watch one time. It was a miracle. Every bite had an instruction. This will explode. You got to bite it and hold. This will melt. This will smoke. This will this. Don't touch that. <laughs> it was amazing. And, and um, unfortunately, it's no longer. But if you can imagine 37 courses, it was superb. Wow. And we have another audience question, which maybe will be on the opposite side of the spectrum. What's your favorite guilty pleasure when it comes to food? <coughs> Let's see. So the best food in the world is someone else's. Every chef will tell you that, right? It's just true. When someone else makes you something, it's going to be better than yourself. There's no way I've, <coughs> I've never did a, did a created this, oh, this is the best in the world. Never is, right? It's someone else's. Um, Onion rings if I'm hungover. <laughs> so that would be the Tuesday, Thursday, <laughs> Saturdays. Um, that's not true. Uh, you, at, at my age, you, it's so hard, right? I mean, there's every age in here, right? But once you break 50, being hungover is so unfun now. Yeah, it onion rings for so breakfast. It takes so long to recover. Really and you're like, why way. am I sweating? And this is. <laughs> Oh, you yeah, had some menopause. Jesus, yeah, it's, it's that. Um, but uh, fried foods is probably my guilty pleasure. Fabulous. Right. I mean, well, you know, jalapeno popper? Well, if it's at the buffet and I'm at the Marriott, yeah. I love it. And we have, um, I think, some, some big Iron Chef fans here, yeah? Um, what is it really like to be on that show, Inquiring Minds Are Wondering? As he grabs his, did you roofie me? You should have. Um, I roofied you. Um, bar none, the most fun and the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I have never given birth to children, but I like, and it's probably just like that. Maybe even harder, and I'm just kidding. It's not harder than that. But it's the most intense thing in the world because 60 minutes is a true 60 minutes. Yeah. And 75 is a true 75. You don't get a second more. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of truisms. A month out, they will tell you three secret ingredients. Because we have to practice. Right? We can't just talk for 30 seconds. Like, okay, go. And then you start breaking ducks down. I mean, we just spoke for 30 seconds, right? So uh, it could be duck, squab, or chicken, or it could be sturgeon, salmon, or this, right? But they're similar enough. There's never been like duck, peanut butter, and you know, wild boar. I mean, they, right? They they make it such that because a fish is a fish is a fish. Honestly, if you're cooking it, so if you want to do this and sashimi, depending on the fish, but you can basically do the same technique. So you do get some time to practice because otherwise, look, and and it makes sense. It's TV. They want everyone to look good, and then someone's going to look awesome, right? They don't want someone to flail and then hunt someone because they've. Back in the day, there have been some chefs that do like two dishes in an hour. And you're supposed to do five dishes plus five plates of each dish. So 25 plates. I mean, it's brutal. And I mean, having, having played squash in college, I played pro squash. I used to race my kids up our stairs at home 
when there were two and three or three and a half, and I would hit them to win because I wasn't going to lose. No freaking participation war in my house. And my wife's like, what are you doing? Let them win. I said, let them win? Never. They're going to crush me one day. And they do now. And they, they hit me harder than I hit them. <laughs> the little bastards. And, um, but I'm that competitive. So Iron Chef for me, combining cooking skills um, and imagination obviously matters. Um, and high pressure. It's, it's, you literally, when you're done, and that I will never run a marathon because the first guy that ran 26.2 died. So stupid. But it's probably like that. That feeling. And you're all over food TV. We have a question about your opinion of social media when it comes to food. <laughs> Is it a force for innovation or does it dilute the importance of technique? Ooh. <laughs> wow, that's a... Uh, I was talking... I, was, I think the newest thing we should talk about is ChatGBT, but we'll get to that in a sec. I was just with the CEO of TikTok, believe it or not, last week, and an interesting conversation on that show did. Um, to propagate and popularize food has always been good, right? I think Food TV, when it hit, PBS was great, Julie and Jacques and Frugal and all those guys, and Food TV hit, and more and more people interested in food. It helped the industry. It helped us think about microgreens and organic and better chicken and better. So all in all, it's great that more and more people were into food. And lots of companies were excited about that. Sub-Zero and Wolf and, uh, and Viking and what all, everyone was excited. All the, the Whole Foods and the stuff they started bringing in edamames and shiso and right? So it was a great thing for everyone. Um, I guess the problem I have is at least half of the YouTube and videos on food and how to cook with X, Y, and Z is what you're hinting at, is people with absolutely no training whatsoever in culinary. And, but I'm not going to sit on my pedestal and say, well, the food sucks, because one, I didn't have it, so I don't know. And two, some of these hacks are like, oh, I'm going to use that on Iron Chef, <laughs> right? So, so, but that's rare. 90% is just crap out there, right? That's like, I would never make that. But who am I to say that 100 people other than me would make that, right? Maybe peanut butter and bacon folded into a quesadilla four times to look like a rose is a great idea. <laughs> Maybe, right? Um, but the thing I have no issue with is that it's still talking about food and wine and cocktails. It's not political, it's not sexist, it's not homophobic, it's not right or wrong. It's just a subjective, you can't say that's wrong. I mean, that may taste horrible, but it's still not wrong. I mean, I guess certain things like, dude, that's just wrong. I mean, that's probably true, right? You just shouldn't do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's just food, right? So I, I, I'm of the belief that you can never get higher if you don't jump for their branch, so go out and just try it. But be honest about it. Don't do something like, oh, this is delicious, and it actually sucks. Don't do that. Just say, oh, my God, this doesn't work. You should never blend escargot with peanut butter. Not a good idea, <laughs> right? So I guess more truism would be great. Yeah. And that would be true for, I can't say it. I guess I'll say it with the GOP. Go ahead. Keep going. Let's go back to talking about people They who should be truthful, right, the people in the government? Right? I mean, Santos, let's talk about someone that's truism. Right? I mean, he, he's my boy. I'm so kidding. He's not my boy. I would love to cook for Santos. First, we would say, have you ever had Peking duck? No, please, down the tray. Get. No, don't move, Santos. And separate his skin from his... I'm sorry, did I go off I track? I could have sworn you yeah, just no, said No, but he's got plenty of political. fat. He would probably be delicious. But this isn't being recorded, is it? S certainly not. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I said duck. By the way, my worst social media post ever, I'm eating, I can't remember who the chef was, and I wrote and I sent it out to the freaking social world. My favorite thing in the world is eat crispy dick. And it went <laughs> out. I had a picture of the duck breast sliced up, it looked beautiful, and all my chef friends chimed in. Like, chef, how do you prepare that? <laughs> That's when I didn't like social media for, the, for those nine minutes. <laughs> And I do not know how to prepare that, in case you're wondering, you sick-minded person. 
So let's go to back to talking about. Hard to moderate me, isn't professional. it? Professional. Oh no, you're easy. I, you know, just let him Come go. Come on, is Abu Dhabi do? <laughs> uh, right? Who's gonna use that? Who's gonna go to the freaking office of the water tower? Hey, uh, I heard this joke. Right? They think you're so fucking international with Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and it's goddamn Barney <laughs> rubble. All right, keep going. This is two hours, and right? And the great, uh, you know, the, the crispy dick recipe they learned, yeah, yeah here at WBUR City Space. That's right. It's on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. You should have it out there, crispy dick. Not a bad name for a restaurant. So let's go back. You want a partner? To talk about restaurants. Ni gong wa. Sui tui the ya. Sui juju. Sui juju in Chinese, right? Crispy dick. Sui juju. I don't know if you could do that. I'll give you all 10%. It was created here. Maybe the next Ming's Bing filling. Um, so That's a lot of ducks, man. I need 7,000 more ducks. <laughs> so let's go back to talking about people who cook professionally. Um, COVID sucked for the restaurant industry. And in a lot of ways, you know, we've all talked about how it uncovered different ways that the industry wasn't working so great anyway, before the pandemic even hit. I really love restaurants, and I would like there to be cool restaurants for me to eat at forever. What do you think needs to happen for the industry to recover and improve and be sustainable for people? What needs to happen for workers? What do guests need to know? How do chefs need to change? Caesar, talk about crispy dick. Um, <laughs> so the first major issue in our industry and it's always been this way, is the sexism, the machoism, the uh, women, are, women can't roll sushi, their hands are too warm. I mean, all this bullshit. This utter bullshit. And I'll tell you why. So I've been blessed enough. Guy Fieri is a good buddy of mine, and I've judged on his show, Tournament of Champions. Have you guys seen it on Food Network? It's the best, it's the best unbiased cooking show. I'm a huge fan of Iron Chef, obviously. But... It's an unbiased cooking show where the, the, it's East versus West, if you've seen it. It's done just like the Sweet 16. It's very cool. So West Coast chefs, East Coast chefs, and in brackets, and you get to the finale. But the cooks, the chefs that are cooking, have no idea who the judges are. And us judges eating the food have no idea who made the food. So there's no bias. It's sexist or just friends. Because if I'm eating a dish that Alex Garen Shelley made, and it's salmon with ginger broth. And I know it's Alex, who's a great friend and a great chef, great cook. I'd be like, oh, God, the nuance of ginger is so subtle. As opposed to the truth, like, I don't fucking taste the ginger. <laughs> right? So this show, we just tell the truth. Because we don't, we don't worry about hurting Michael Vitaggio's feelings. We don't know who's made the dish. Nancy Silverton is a wonderful judge. She can always tell if a female made the dish versus a male, which I find fascinating. Um, and and I'm, I'm not as good as her. Um, I can always tell when an ethnic chef is cooking, cooking versus someone trying to force it. My point is, four seasons, four finales, every finalist in four seasons have been women, 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 and women, women. Hats off, ladies. So when it's unbiased, women are better chefs than men, period. Which is really hard to, I shouldn't say hard to swallow, that'd be a really bad pun right then. <laughs> hard, hard to imagine, like, how's that possible? We're 90% male, but ta-da, it's right there. So we gotta lose all that, because <laughs> there's such BS that men are better chefs than women. It's not even, I never believe that myself, and it's not true. <clears throat> and this whole machoism, I can grab a steak with my hand, you know, back to Tony Bourdain's books, that's, that, that was the way it was. He was telling the truth. I worked in France. And they were sexist. They called the dishwashers Les Noir, which is the blacks, like to their face. I'm like, dude, this is Andre, and this is Jose Jolis, and right, and it's that. And, and that was never right. But that's the way a lot of chefs were brought up in France and European culture, and then China as well. China, every chef was male. The better cooks were the females at home, but the professional chefs are all male. So we have to lose that. Just have to. And that starts with chefs like me, chefs like you, all my Ken Orger, Jamie Bissett, all these great chefs in, this, in, in Boston and in this country are not like that. We, we are not that old guard. So it starts with that because you have to lead by example. Business-wise, 
fine dining has no problem whatsoever, right? Because billionaires actually made more money, right? Out of Yellowstone Club where I'm at, they're all up 20%. So French Laundry, Danielle, Jean Georges, they're fine. Mandarin Oriental, Gordon Ramsay, fine. Fast food, equally fine, right? Because unfortunately, there's 50% of our country that has to eat. And I, I would actually be so bold to say one of my ventures and goals of Ming's Bings is to end up at a McDonald's because the reason this country is fat, the reason there's obesity is poverty, period. Amen. Single mom, single dad, three children, you have 20 bucks, you have three jobs. I'm not going to say go get organic in New Zealand, blah, 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 and some carrots and cook this. They can't. They don't know how. They don't have a pot. They just don't have the time. So they have to eat at McDonald's. So I'm hoping one day that a gluten-free, plant-based, cholesterol-free alternative that kids and adults will like to eat as much because it has satiation to it, that's one of my goals. And, but I think the problem in restaurants is going to be the middle restaurants, the restaurants that 25 to 45 ahead. Those, uh, the, I don't know if it's Applebee's. I don't even know those. Those restaurants are in trouble because... Everyone in this room knows you can save so much more money cooking that food at home, right? You don't need to go out to eat that food. You can easily do it. You need to go out to eat French laundry food because there's one Thomas Keller. And fast food is so cheap, that's fine. But it's the middle one that's going to have a problem. What us chefs and chef owners need to ask and implore into all diners is understand how much more it costs to run a restaurant. And not just ingredients because of COVID and all that and rent and electricity and water. That is all true. But for us to evil the playing field, to have happy cooks and dishwashers and happy waiters, and waiters are already happy because they make a lot more money, but we have to even it out such that dishwashers and cooks make a livable wage, which is not 18 an hour. You can't live on that. But the only way to get 25 an hour to cooks a livable wage or more is we have to charge more. And that is for the, the that, that's the top, because everyone's used to paying $52 for the Chilean sea bass of blue ginger. And if I went to 65 overnight, there would be some outcry. So there's, it's, a, it's not happening overnight, but there's an education process and a way to explain to the diners, because I think everyone here in this room would rather still have those restaurants around. Maybe you'll go twice a month versus three times a month because it's more expensive. But by paying more, those restaurants will then be there next week as well. Because otherwise, it's a vicious circle. And, and, and we also have this whole labor shortage. We've lost 20 to 25% of all restaurant employees permanently during the COVID. They just went elsewhere. They went to day trading, which lasts about two weeks. So they're not doing that anymore, but they tried. And of course, landscaping, which is classic in the summer, but when, you know, now there's snow plowing, whatever. But we lost 25% of front and back house permanently. So that's also another issue. And a lot of them we actually lost to COVID also because working in a restaurant was one of the most dangerous jobs. Oh, brutal. I, all of us cooks, we were all cooking with a mask on. It was the most uncomfortable, horrible. I mean, everyone got acne because you're just sweating, you know, eight hours a day with a mask on. And it was, yeah, it was miserable. No fun. I have a solution, though. I have a solution for this whole industry. Graphite. And what did you say? Graphite? Graphite. Graphite. <laughs> You know what? I thought you'd be smarter <laughs> than the average person being Asian. It's pretty good. Um, because the other major issue that we're not touching on is mental illness. Mm. In this room, in our industry, times 10, right? I mean, you add 18 to 25-year-old kids, I'll call them, in a restaurant environment with booze and drugs and it's 2 a.m., mental illness sets in for lots of reasons. One of the highest demographics of the highest suicide rate are 18 to 25-year-old males in ski resorts. Figure that out, right? You figure they're happy. They get to ski and this, but they're by themselves, maybe a broken home, four to a room. They make just enough money to maybe, they get a ski pass, so they get to do that, but they don't get to go out and eat and do everything being a chef. One of the greatest joys of being a chef is eating other people's food, but if you don't make enough money to do that, that really sucks, right? And mental illness is just rampant, right? I don't need to even start on, we don't have time to talk about it all, but mass killings, suicide, that's enough. The, those, just those two would take enough people out of this country, right, out of this world. And in the chef restaurant world, it's even higher 
because of everything you just mentioned. And, and us owners have to address it. We have to address it. And, and there's also a huge population of high school kids, especially high school kids, that are not varsity athletes, that can't sing and dance. And this is about 85% of the high school. They're not superstars. So they fall into this category like, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, and I'm, I'm no good. I don't want And so they either get into drugs or this or that. And, and it's just amazing. I mean, I don't care if you're a prep school like at Andover. My son lost a friend who killed himself. And every school has these kids that kill themselves. And so it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, black or white. It doesn't matter, right? Mental illness is, is everywhere. And I really think that these kids that don't have – they think they don't have a, an ounce of talent. They think they can't – do anything for society. They think that they're just there. I just want to end it. I don't want to. I, I don't make anyone happy. My parents yell at me. It, it's brutal. I think if we could teach these kids how to cook, actually start a foundation, and I'm working with one of the most you you guys might know him, but Paul Farmer's old partner, uh, Jim Kim, right, Dr. Kim. So I was at a, a great symposium with him. He wants to eradicate mental illness. He's going to do what he did with TB, malaria, in Haiti, and with AIDS in Africa. He's going to, his next major project is mental illness and how to, how, to not, how to try to solve and give this entire group of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young kids something they could think of doing. And, and I, just by experience alone, when you make a dish and it actually tastes good, you are the happiest person on earth. And if someone else says it tastes good, you just made that person's life. They're like, I can make something that actually made you smile, mm. which is why I'm a chef. That was the reason at 10 years old, I made my first fried rice. The couple that was in our house because my parents were gone, they smiled because I made a fried rice. I had way too much oil and too much soy sauce. <laughs> but they didn't think that. They thought this was the best thing that a 10-year-old could ever do, and they smiled. That's why I'm a chef. And I so wholeheartedly think that if we can take this, this group, because we need home ec classes, right? We need accounting classes and home ec classes, <laughs> right? And there was slavery, for the record, for you morons out there that want to take that away. Well, whatever. We won't get there either. But, and that both the doctors I mentioned this too, were they loved the idea. Because not only does this give... A, a, a solution. It's easy to stand up there with a you know, billion dollars and say, we're going to eradicate mental illness. But how? How can you do that? It's not just classes and books and drugs, because drugs, half the people end up killing themselves. So that's not the solution. Got to give them a métier that they have self-fulfillment and self-esteem and self-worth. And this also solves the problem. We need two million more cooks. So let's help them to help us to help them. Mm, thank you, so, Chef. That's next week. And um, the team at WBUR wanted me to share that if you or someone you know needs help, you can call 988 for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, is, that, is that a national number? Yes, I believe so. Gee, I never knew that. 988? 988. It's good to know. Yeah. And it's Ming, what I'm hearing you say also is that we, we need diners to come along with us if we are going to have that future with great restaurants that offer great jobs. Um, to people who are well. And um, I think probably most folks in this room know that the average profit margin for an independent restaurant prior to COVID uh, was between three and 5%. And I don't think anyone's doing the math on what it is right now um, because it would be too depressing. Um, but I think when you talk about the middle, it's so interesting because so many of the mom and pop businesses we love so much are squarely in that middle. Um, and that's who I really hope we are able to continue to support. I'm also curious, um, you know, Tiffany Faison was here a couple weeks ago talking about abuse um, and some of the issues that you've mentioned. Do you think that Boston will have a, a Me Too moment in the restaurant industry? Um, have we not? Have we not been talking about it enough? I mean, you mean I more mean, specific? The, we had Batali's case here, but he's, you know, we don't claim him. Um, I mean, no one does, but. Yeah. I mean, are you saying is there going to be another gigantic fiasco? Yeah, or even or anyone about? held accountable for, um, like, anything. 
<laughs> well, I burnt a bing earlier. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope every day, right? I mean, yeah. I, I hope, I, I, I think, I can proudly say all my chef buddies around the country, I was just on the phone with Daniel Blood and Thomas Keller, we were in Leon, none of us are like that, right? So it's, it's, it's like social media. The bad boys get the press, right? So, that, so it's not the whole industry is a bunch of SOBs. It's not. And, and I do think, um, I mean, I, I, like I do at my restaurant, I think we just have to lead by example because it's the next generation that's going to actually make the change. Right. right. We the the damage has been done by my generation, so to speak. And I get I don't know if it's thirty percent, fifty percent, but there's the bad the bad people. But we're hoping ninety percent good people in the next generation. Right. And and you know, and thank God women are are not taking shit anymore. Right? It used to be oh, okay, chef, all right, chef, right, because they wanted to get ahead. But now I, I think women I mean you look at CIA, it's fifty percent women, fifty percent men. Right, and, that, and there's no no one's gonna say ever, and I will never say it as I just proved with tournament champions that men are better cooks. We're not. The only thing we're better at is we're bigger. That's about it, in general. Not all men, <laughs> but most men are bigger than women. That's about all we can say. Right. Right. But that, but the, not, they have we have nothing else on women. And I want to switch gears to something that. Um, I think is an issue that's very important to you that you've contributed significantly to. Most people know you from Simply Ming, but as an industry insider, I happen to know that you also starred in the widely popular Massachusetts Allergen Training Program. Um, if anyone here has been Allergen Awareness certified, you know all about Ming. Um, tell us a little bit about why this issue is so important to you. Uh, so this is a simple one. So David, who's now 22, was born with life-threatening food allergies to soy, wheat, dairy, shellfish, peanuts, trina sex. It's seven of the eight, right? Very funny, un funny unfunny joke from upstairs. <laughs> like, ha, got you. Um, it became my calling. It became, uh, it's very, I was in Framingham. David was three. Uh, we were first told by our pediatrician, there's nothing you can do. Suck it up. Don't feed him those allergens. He may die. Great advice, dude. We didn't go back to him. Um, and at three years old, I was uh, when Dave was three, I went to a restaurant in Framingham, not to be mentioned. I walked in, looked for the guy in a coat and tie not doing anything. That's the manager. Went to the manager and said, hey, look, dude. Hi, I'm Ming Sai. You no know idea who it was, which is fine. This is my son. Here is allergies. He would like some, I saw your menu. He likes some turkey with some lettuce. That'd be great. And he looked at me, and my son's right here. And he goes, we'd rather not serve you. Right? And I looked at him, and, you know, and I'm not a violent guy, but if I was, I would have slugged him. But you can't, my son's right there. And, they, and he asked me, he goes, well, why are we going? He goes, ah, oh, that food's no good there, son. He goes, no, 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 really? No, why? Right? I'm like, that is so un-American. That is so wrong. That's also called discrimination. Yeah. Right? Skin color, you couldn't get into a restaurant. Wheelchair, you couldn't get into a restaurant. Allergy, now you can't get into a restaurant? That's bullshit. So I became my calling. says, this is wrong. We need to make restaurants safer. If you do not know what's in your food, go sell cars. Don't make food. Period. And so that blurb you see now across the country, I'm very proud of, if you have a life threatening food allergy, notify your server while ordering, is, is my blurb. I came up with that. And I came up with this. Thank you. And I came up with a system that if you go to Surf Safe, which is the videos they played na nationwide, or Ming.com, there's a sheet that's just engineering done on an Excel spreadsheet that has the eight, now a nine allergen, because the ninth one is sesame. Sesame is becoming so common, right? So we have nine boxes, and this recipe in my restaurant, every one of my restaurants always had, we call it the Bible. Uh, for Surf Safe, we call it the Food Service Reference Manual, because we couldn't say Bible. I says, well, how about Koran? We couldn't use a Koran either. <laughs> so we want a reference manual. Whatever. And um, it's okay, Muhammad, we'll keep to this. So we, um, it lists the rest, it doesn't list the recipe, but like steak and potatoes dish. It says steak and it lists everything in the marinade. So why is soy checked off? Soy is checked off because there's soy sauce in the marinade of the steak. And then starch one has butter because it's mashed potatoes. Starch two has ginger and sesame oil because of the broccoli. Then sauce one, sauce two, and then garnish one, garnish two. Garnish two, actually, we have shrimp, uh, shellfish checked off because garnish two is a potato chip fried in the fryer that shrimp was fried in. 
right? So down to the molecules. And this you cannot do Saturday night at 745. This you do way in advance and train your team because it's in a Bible. It's in a three-ring binder. And if you do that, it's actually cakewalk because you're used to it. You know what's in the dish. You have to check it. There's a system. And you try not to kill someone because I can't imagine a worse press possible article than Ming Tsai kills two people at Blue Ginger. Bad, right? <laughs> so that's what I did. And, and, and proudly, as a side note, so this really helped. It's greatly reduced. You know, and unfortunately, kids still die and adults still die because they don't have an EpiPen or whatever. Uh, airplanes are still arguments all the time. I had, I had a great argument one with this guy. It was a little bit large. That's irrelevant, except I'm not a nice guy when, they're, when in my kid's life is dependent on it. We were all in first class. I asked the gentleman and said, hey, look, listen, my, life, my son has life-threatening to peanuts and tree nuts. Can, can we not? I first asked the, the flight attendant, can we not serve the warm nuts? Um, and she's like, not a problem. Um, if you could just clear it with the, you know, the person next to you. And I said, sir, you, if you don't mind. I just, it was just almost like, sir, if you don't mind breathing. It's like, sir, you don't mind if you could not serve nuts. And he looked at me and goes, I pay for those nuts. <laughs> like, and I look at him and says, you know, sir, based on your size, I don't think you need any. That didn't help. <laughs> He's like, what? Huh? You can't get up, can you? Can't get up, can you? Can't get up. It kept, he tried to get up. But he couldn't get up because he was obese. Um, that strategy doesn't work well. We had five hours together on the flight, so not, not so good. He's, and he's still fat, so whatever. Um, so I'm not nice when you're trying to, when my kid's life is, is at stake. Uh, I do think, and this is a side note, if you have food allergies and you have a young child, allergyart, A-R-T dot com. My son's been cured. He was patient zero with a woman named Amy Tieringer. She said allergy art, A-R-T is allergy release technique, cleared wheat, soy, dairy, boom, boom, boom. The last, in her office, we did a peanut challenge. He's been in China three times. He has no more allergies. So you can get cured. So there's that. And, 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 it's, and it's energy over anything else. It's, it's desensitization, but it's like Nate and tapping and breathing, and I'm not allergic to nuts, I'm not allergic to nuts, I'm not allergic to nuts, I'm not allergic to nuts. Wow. Crazy. It's very crazy. He, she cleared her son in 2008 I'm at the Beijing Olympics. Her son, who was 21, had peanut allergies, which is kind of funny that the allergy doctor had a son with peanut allergies, but the son was too old to get cleared. She saw David at age 5 to age 10 once a week, so 250, 60 times in a row, and that's how he got cleared. So a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. The son had an allergic reaction in China. We're eating in a restaurant. I told the chef, this guy can die if he eats peanuts, no problem, I speak Chinese. The son had a reaction. He got it from the table, like, where are you going? He goes, I, I gotta go upstairs, I'll be fine. He sure goes, I'm fine. He calls his mom, Amy, in Lexington from Beijing. Mom clears him. Okay, thanks mom. Comes back down, finishes dinner. Wow. But, but this stuff exists. Does anyone see anyone with ESP or Ben Metal or Ben Glass? Real stuff. I've seen, it, I've seen it all. I have a fork. I have a fork in my home that I bring to graduation speeches because I love to just freak people out. This fork, I was at Rose Wharf for a charity event. I'm not cooking. My wife and I are guests. There's an experimentalist who are these magician metal mind reader people. And he grabbed a fish fork, just three times, off a table with three forks and three knives, puts it in my wife's hand, like this. And without touching the fork, it spins twice in her hand, which is already pretty amazing. She opens it up, and the fork is twisted around twice. You cannot twist it back. He bent metal in front of our eyes. He also took a glass of white wine, and the glass bent till it almost spilled out, bent till it almost spilled out, and handed it back to you. That stuff exists. Everyone can believe that Jordan and Gretzky are elite athletes, and they say Gretzky sees it in slow motion. Jordan's still going up as everyone's coming down. That's believable, especially, you know, especially if you're an athlete. Like, oh, yeah, they see stuff in slow motion. Well, Einstein and, and Newton, they did different things like that elite-wise, but used their brain, right? And people can absolutely read other people's minds. I've seen it. I've seen people just read their mind and like, is there the, I'm in, at gambling? They can read their mind. Oh, he is, he is only a 16. I've seen it all. It's real. So.
I'm just going to let him keep going. It's fascinating. No, it's no. I am, um, but, but. I mean, I, if I could bend metal, I would do it for you, but <laughs> I can't. Um, I would be remiss not to bring up Ming's Bings. Oh, what? What's that? What is oh, that? Oh, shit. Look at that. So this is also kind of a, a food as health and, and food as wellness topic for you. Yep. Um, your wife was diagnosed with cancer yep. five years ago, and, and yep. Polly's doing okay now. Polly's great. Thank you very much. So, Wonderful. Um, I'm very proud of Ming's Bings. We, like I said, we launched February, COVID started in March. So that time was ridiculous. But the reason I started the company was, uh, like Irene said, my wife had a cancer diagnosis. Uh, thank God we're in Boston, Dana Farber, right? Thank you very much, Dana Farber. Uh, oral chemo, wiped her cancer out. But we also decided for all the research and the way we lived that she should go vegan. And uh, to basically to reduce inflammation. Right, salmon, beef, pork, chicken, all have inflammation. Gluten has inflammation. Uh, reduce sugar. Cancer feeds on sugar. Right? I mean, it, it all makes sense. And eat more plants. None of this is like, oh wow, that better broccoli is better for you than jalapeno poppers. <laughs> what a shocker, <laughs> right? So, um, so f six and a, five and a half years ago, I go to Whole Foods and Wegmans. I'm like, okay, veggie patty market, Boca, Gardein. Right, uh, Dr. Prager's, they're all emulsified hockey pucks. They're not delicious. You could kill someone with them, right? So they're great for self-defense, right? <laughs> but besides that, they're horrible, right? Plus, you need lettuce and tomato and sauce and a bun to, to eat them. So it became my calling to redefine the veggie patty market. I'm like, you know what? I'm smart enough. I have a reason to do this. I need something that my wife can eat when I'm traveling. And because I, when I'm home, she eats really well. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but when I'm not home, she's, she's, you know, she's like Cheerios for lunch, Cheerios for dinner. I'm like, that's not a meal. Go, no, look, two grams of protein, exactly. So I flipped the paradigm. I, I, I developed a gluten-free brown rice wrapper. So I wanted to put the emulsification on the outside rather than emulsifying chickpeas or soybeans or beans on the inside. Because even Thomas Keller can't make a pureed bean burger taste good. It's pureed beans. It's impossible. So by developing this brown rice wrapper, we then found the best tasting plant-based protein called Before the Butcher. I literally did a blind taste test, impossible beyond 10 different ones, blind taste, Before the Butcher one. It's also the cleanest label. It's GMO-free soybeans with the least amount of ingredients. And with that as the base, we then chef it out. Grilled onions or smoky onions and spices and peppers and whatever. So we now have nine flavors. We have four breakfast bangs, which are awesome, made with just egg, which is a mung bean scrambled egg product. Really good. Obviously, zero cholesterol uses one hundredth the amount of water than regular eggs. Um, and then, so four breakfast bangs and five savory bangs. Um, and uh, our motto is eat good, feel good, do good. Thank you for this brilliant question, by the way. Um, <laughs> eat good, feel good, do good. Eat good, because I'm an Iron Chef. It has to eat good. It has to be delicious. Any CPG product, yours, mine, anyone's. If it doesn't taste good, start over. You're not going to get another sale. So it has to be delicious. Feel good, plant-based, makes you feel better. Research shows that, and you actually do feel better. You also feel better in your head because it's a little bit better for the planet as well. If you happen to read something like the New York Times, which is not failing, by the way. Um, and third, do good. Do good because some proceeds of all Ming's Bings benefit both Dana Farber and an awesome charity called Family Reach. I'm proudly the president of their board. We financially help families dealing with cancer. It's the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. It's the second most proudest thing I've ever done over my two children. I've raised over 10 million bucks for Family Reach and helped these families across the country. So that's what we do. We have one more audience question, um, and it's a two-parter. I think we're done. <laughs> if you had to give a beginner chef a piece of advice, what would it be? And part two is, what's the greatest piece of advice you've been given? Wow. Um, they're a young kid wanting <coughs> to be a chef, or they're a cook already cook and want to be a chef. It's a little different. Uh, dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. OK. Great, thanks. That didn't help. Um, <laughs> I've had interviews with people like, Chef, I, I, I want to be famous. Next, 
don't ever say that in an interview with a chef, right? That's the re most ridiculous thing. If the intention of being a chef is what I said earlier, is you want to make people happy through food, you'll be a great chef, right? Because we all want to make people happy, right? Comedians do it. Musicians do it. Artists do it, right? It's a different reaction. Food is the one that goes all the way into your body. It's the only one that's every sense. And that's why we're in hospitality. That's why I'm in hospitality. I want, to, I want to be able to change you. You come to my restaurant, you're pissed off, you're this, bad job, bad partner, bad whatever, and you leave happy. Yes, of course, maybe the wine helped out, but it's the experience. It's the service, right? It's, it's how you're treated. And as a chef, your goal has to be, I want to make delicious food that makes people happy. And if that's your premise, you're going to do just fine. And the one skill that you have to always do is taste as you go. That's for home cooks. I do it at home too, right? And that's for every professional chef. Because even though I've made this Peking duck or this Chilean sea bass 500,000 times, I haven't made it today. So I still taste. I taste the whole line before every service. I taste the water to make sure there's enough salt in it to boil the noodles. We taste everything you can taste besides raw meat. I don't need to taste. I have to assume they can cook the steak and the fish. But any sauce, any vinegar, anything you can taste, we taste. So that, to taste, taste, taste. What That's great advice. Part, what was the part two? Part two is the greatest My piece of advice? advice you've been given. <clears throat> oh, there's so many. Recently, my, my partner at, at Yellowstone Club, Sam Burns, says, always treat everyone fairly. You don't have to treat them equally. That's a good one. But the best one, um, two, one's from my grandfather, which is butcher by butcher. Butcher by butcher means you might as well eat it because you've already paid for it. <laughs> so anytime we're at our home at a big banquet, my parents and grandparents would always say that because if we all this food on the table, you might as well eat it. You already paid for it, right? That. And then I think my, my all-time favorite, I uh, have two more. I'll do another Chinese and my last one. Haran Haobao is the other Chinese expression that both my parents and grandparents always said. Literally, Haoren, good person, Haobao, good fortune. So nice guys don't finish last. Mm -hmm. Be kind, be nice, it matters. Karma is real, karma is here. Um, it's absolutely true. And then my dad, my dad worked for the government and he always said, son, always, always tell the truth, but you don't have to tell the whole truth. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Great advice. Chef Ming, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you to our audience here at City Space and at home. So we are, we are serving you some bings. <clears throat> I have my crew here that are cooking bings up, I guess, on the way out. Um, there are two flavors. There's a sausage and pepper, which is, I assume you know, we're the official bing on the Boston Red Sox, right? And so we serve a lot of sausage and pepper, and we have our New and improved eight veggie bing. You're actually the first people to try it. Literally off the line, yesterday was the first time we created them. Um, eight veg was watercress and shiitakes, garlic, ginger, onions, eight amamis. That's the eight veg. We've, um, because average America does not like the flavor of watercress as much as us Chinese do. Watercress is a bit bitter. So now it's 50 50 watercress and spinach. Um, and shiitakes, which we all love, especially us Asians, um, is a little too mushroomy, again, for the American middle palate. So now it's 50-50 button mushrooms and shiitake. So it's a little bit more mild, but equally delicious. So I encourage you, uh, and I hope you enjoy them. Um, and I believe my CEO is here. I know he's here. He's going to give you a coupon for a free box of bangs. So make sure you cash in on that. And the more you buy them and then buy them again and then buy them a third time, <laughs> otherwise you'll never be invited back to the BER city space. <laughs> right? Amy, right? Right. right. Thank I, you. Can, I can attest to the fact that these smell so divine. I cannot wait to taste a morsel of them. So we have samples for you outside, and it's a wonderful concept, Ming's Bing. So you're about to get a real treat. And also, uh, Ming and his executive chef were so patient with me because we didn't quite have the right oven, and we made it all work, and Ming discovered a little oven in our kitchen that um, he taught us something tonight. That I'm taking um, with me. <laughs>
please come to our next curated cuisine in March, March 14th, Pie Day, which it, we're having Lauren Co. talk about her new book about pies. Please head out to the lobby. We'll see you there. Bye-bye. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. That was awesome.